we're ready, I'll hand over to you. Right, we're just having a few more people. Uh, I think we'll end your poll there. So, Beck, I'll, um, do you want me to reference your poll or would you rather wait until after? Oh, you're still on mute, Beck. Un unmute. There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> um, yes, I'd love to have the, the poll and then I'll put it into, uh, hopefully I'll be able to remember it in my presentation. Cool. So Beck's question was, uh, poll question I should say, I have a deep ache slash heaviness in my pelvis or vagina area after I have been running. And we had 14% say yes and 87% yep. say no. Great. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad to see, well, I'm not, not happy for the 14%, but um, it is a little bit lower than I was expecting. Okay. I'll just come back to the beginning. Okay, guys. So, yes, I'm going to talk today about uh, the recreational runner and pelvic floor dysfunction, which is uh, something that I'm quite passionate about. So a virtual hands up here, who can relate to this? Uh, I don't think my pelvic floor is too bad because uh, I don't leak. Have you ever heard that before? The most commonly known of all pelvic floor dysfunctions is urinary stress incontinence. And it's caused when we is forced out of the body due to an increase in the forces or pressure around the bladder and the inability of the body, mainly the pelvic floor, which we'll talk more about in a moment, to prevent that from happening. It often occurs day to day with coughing or sneezing or even laughing, but it can also occur with physical activities such as jumping and running. Of interest, one in four Australians are incontinent, and that includes one in three women, one in 10 men, and one in five children. So it's, it's really, really um, a, a big issue, and it needs not to be a taboo, a taboo issue. Other pelvic floor conditions uh, include overactive bladder and that occurs when there's a sudden overwhelming urge to do a wee which just can't be put off and it's not associated with how much you've drank or when you last went to the toilet. Another form of pelvic uh, floor dysfunction is prolapse and that's where the pelvic organs, bladder, uterus or bowel, tend to be sitting a little bit too low in the pelvis and that's often sensed as, at, like the poll said, a heaviness or dragging sensation. Another pelvic floor dysfunction that you may not be aware of so much of is pelvic pain. And that's quite misunderstood, um, but is extremely common. There's lots of potential causes, but one that we often see in runners is pelvic floor muscle overactivity. And that means that the pelvic floor muscles are just working a bit too hard um, and they can get tense or they can go into spasm and cause pain. It might be a, a deep ache feeling or it might be a sharp spasm type pain. Um, it's usually on the inside of the pelvis, so um, uh, sort of in the vagina area or deep in the pelvis. Um, if it's on the outside, perhaps on the front of the pelvic bones, it may be more the outer muscles of, or tendons of the lower abdominal groin area, just working a bit too hard. So when does pelvic floor dysfunction tend to happen in runners? Um, well, this is a pretty common scenario. Uh, say you've been running five or 10 Ks two or three times a week. Um, you've been doing it for a while, you feel really comfortable. And then someone suggests that perhaps you should train for an event, maybe you see the bay, a 10 K, a half, a full marathon, a trail event. So you start training, you, you follow the plan, um, you add in an extra run, um, you make one of your long run and a hill session or a tempo run. Then one day that you notice just a little bit of weight seems to be coming out towards the end of your run or maybe it was on the downhill, or maybe it was on the speed session. Or maybe you're not leaking, but instead you're just feeling this heaviness or a dragging sensation in the vagina towards the end of your session or the next day. Well, these and, and other symptoms such as urgency are signs of the pelvic floor problem starting to occur. And just like a niggle in the hamstring may make you go, oh, I better, I better uh, tune into that, this is something else you also need to tune into. So if we now look at the pelvic floor, so we'll start with a bit of simple anatomy, we'll use our hands. Um, if you can take one hand and pop it down on your pubic bone, which is the bone at the front of your pelvis, down below your belly button. Okay, and now use your two hands and pop them under your bottom and on your sitting bones. Okay, and rock side to side, you can feel that. And then if you use a hand, slide it down your spine, 
until you get to the sacrum, which is the big plate area, and then just keep sliding it down until you reach the coccyx. The pelvic floor fits that area in the middle. It's literally the floor of the pelvis. And of interest, both women and men have a pelvic floor. If you look into the pelvis now as if it was a bowl, you'll notice there's two big holes. I'll just use my pointer hopefully there. There's a, one at the front and then one sort of in the middle. The top one is where the urethra um, and vagina go through and the back is where the, the rectum, the lower part of the bowel goes through. These are the weak spots of the pelvic floor. It's where things can go wrong if your pelvic floor muscles just aren't working well. The job of a good pelvic floor is to contract adequately when there's a force putting pressure on the pelvic organs. When the pelvic floor muscles contract, they effectively close or decrease those holes, that weak spot. Um, they compress the urethra against the pubic bone at the front and they kink the, the rectum like a hose and it stops any pool or wind escaping. They also help support the pelvic organs, giving them a really good base. Then when the forces decrease, the pelvic floor needs to be able to relax, lengthen and recover, ready for its next activity. All right, so what can go wrong? Um, this is a, a, a Norton's boat in a dry dock analogy. So Norton was a, or is a pelvic floor researcher. And I think this is a really nice way of getting an idea of what's going on. So try to picture a boat sitting in a marina, sitting safely secured to its dock by its moorings. However, the moorings are only so long as their job is really just to provide side to side support and prevent the boat from drifting away. But the boat's really not going anywhere because the water is gently supporting it from underneath. But what would happen if the water started to drop down? Did you see that the boat would also start to drop down um, and it would be starting to tug on those moorings? Over time, if that water drop, that water level kept dropping down and um, the boat would sink to the bottom and the moorings may even snap. The role of the pelvic floor is that of the water to gently and actively support the pelvic organs of the boat and keep the strain off the moorings. If the pelvic floor is not adequate for the job at hand, so in this case for running, then the pelvic organs uh, will not be supported as well as they could and, and problems can start to occur. So the bladder could drop down a bit and a bit of weed could be forced out. The bladder just may not be supported as well as it should and might get a sense of urgency needed to go to the toilet. The bladder, uterus and bowel may drop down a bit too much and it's felt as heaviness. Your pelvic floor muscles may go into spasm trying to do their job and that may be felt as pain. So let's get a little bit technical and look at some of the forces put on the pelvic floor with running. So. Let's go back to is it year 10 physics. Newton's third law that says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Research has shown that at heel strike and through the propulsive phase of running, so land, stand, push, the ground reaction force is up to three times body weight. So if you think about for a, um, for a 65 kilo woman, each time she takes a step, there's approximately 195 kilos of force coming back up at her through her heel, through her knee, through her calf, hamstring, into her hip, through her pelvis. That's a lot of uh, forces that those structures, which includes the pelvic floor, have to control, absorb or dissipate. Now, what if she was 80 kilos or 100 kilos? It increases those ground reaction forces. Now, let's think about how many steps you take on the average 5, 10, 15, 20, 42k run. So you get a lot of forces that the pelvic floor has to work at. There was a, a study by a Swiss group of research which looked at the activity of the pelvic floor during different running speeds in both continent and incontinent women. So incontinent are women who leak. They used a specialised electrode which is inserted into the woman's vagina and from that they were able to measure uh, its electrical activity or the electrical activity of the pelvic floor. So that's the EMG. They did a number of pre-tests to determine what the strength was that the woman could squeeze at rest. And that was called her uh, maximum voluntary contraction, MDC. They then put her on a treadmill and had her run at different speeds to see what happened to the pelvic floor muscle activity. 
And what they found in both continent and incontinent women was that just before heel strike and just before push off, so those same time where the ground reaction forces were greatest from the previous slide, there was a huge, huge spike in pelvic floor muscle activity. At seven kilometres per hour, her pelvic floor muscle activity was between 45 and 90% of its ability to contract. At 11 kilometres per hour, it went up to between 55 and 107% of its ability. So it's working harder than it was actually able to voluntarily contract. Then at 15 kilometres per hour, so sprinting or perhaps running downhill, the pelvic floor muscle activity went up significantly to between 80 and 150% of its actual ability. I mean, that's crazy, what it is to me. But what does it really mean to you? Is it all just kind of, you know, a bit of double dutch? Sorry, I really like that picture. What it means is that when you're running at higher speeds, intensities, frequencies, or for longer durations, your pelvic floor muscle works harder. No surprise, so does every other part of your body. And just like any other part of your body, if your pelvic floor is not conditioned for that speed, intensity, frequency, or duration, you may start to suffer from some of these pelvic floor dysfunctions. Well, does it really matter? Does it matter if you leg a bit here and there? Is it really going to affect you long term? Can we predict who is going to suffer from pelvic floor problems? Well, there's a myriad of reasons of why women may develop pelvic floor dysfunction with running, but there are a few key life stages that make a woman more susceptible. So this is an interpretation of a lifespan model for pelvic floor dysfunctions by a fellow called John Zolanti, who again is a pelvic floor researcher. I'm showing you this so you can see that there is a normal age-related decline in pelvic floor function over a woman's lifespan. There's also a symptom threshold that may be different for every woman. The trick is to keep yourself above that symptom threshold. So John Delancey suggested that there's three phases um, in a lifespan, um, three distinctive phases, which uh, can impact your ability to stay above that symptom threshold. Some we can influence and some we can't. So the first one, phase one, are these predisposing factors, and we can't do much about them. That, that includes our genetics, our general health, well-being, nutrition through childhood development. That helps us pe to temp determine, sorry, what the potential for our pelvic floor function is. We can't undo that. The second phase is something he calls inciting factors. And these are the events that cause a rapid decline in pelvic floor function that we need to work extremely hard to, re to rehabilitate from as much as possible. Um, this is probably things that you think of, which is pregnancy and childbirth, um, and particularly instrument deliveries such as forceps. The other thing it includes is that lovely one, which we'll talk more about at the moment, called menopause. But it can also include surgeries or particular chronic health conditions. So they're their inciting factors. And the third phase he talks about a lot is these intervening factors. These are the issues that can have a negative effect on the pelvic floor, such as a chronic cough, where you're coughing a lot and a little bit of wee comes out. I had a little bit of coughing bit before, and wee came out, probably too much inflammation. Um, uh, constipation, so straining on the toilet, constant poor quality lifting. You know, that lifting where you're doing this type of thing. Um, interestingly, ex excessive abdominal girth also puts pressure onto your pelvic floor. Um, so all those things can cause a bit of strain on the pelvic floor, but it also includes those exercises that cause pelvic floor dysfunction, such as running and wetting yourself, or running and feeling urgent, or running and feeling a heaviness, or running and feeling pelvic pain. While it may be only occurring once or twice, it may not be an issue, but if it continues to happen and you ignore those signs over months or years, it may lead to an increase in the rate of natural decline and pop you over the symptom threshold. So let's look at two key inciting factors. So John Delancey said, children recognise the impossibility of childbirth. Yet as a society, we still don't appreciate that a labouring mother effectively needs to push a bowling ball through a keyhole. 
MRI technology has measured the pelvic floor muscles during a vaginal birth and found them to lengthen up to 300%, which is huge. Think about how much your hamstring hurts when you gently stretch it. So often this 300% can lead to damage to the muscles and supporting tissue and nerves. This has to rest. This has to rest fully and then recover and then be rehabilitated back to full function. Let's compare the pair. Hamstring tear versus a pelvic floor tear. So you imagine if you're a runner who tears their hamstring and can't run. Would that runner, if particularly if they were high level, would they rest for a couple of days and then just tuck it out? Unlikely. They're more likely to undergo months and months of firstly rest and then recovery and then rehab and slow loading back to competition. Yet here in Australia and much of the Western world, we don't do that with new mothers. They have a few days in hospital and then they go home and often to no or very little of support. Um, they may try and rest a bit, but the pressures to get back into everything are huge. Some women will try and wait until their six week checkup with their doctor. And at these appointments, they're often told, yep, everything seems to be going okay. Yeah, you can start getting back into everything. Just take it easy. But what, what does that mean? We, what does that mean? Does it mean go for a gentle jog around the block? Who knows? We have really good evidence that after a vaginal birth, the pelvic floor really doesn't recover its full function for several months. And in some cases, much longer if there's been significant damage done. And much like the hamstring injury, the pelvic floor needs rest and then a specific and progressive rehab program with gradual loading to get it back to full function before the introduction of impact activities such as running. Otherwise, it might just stay slightly weak and poorly coordinated, which can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction symptoms during running and potentially an accelerated rate of age-related pelvic floor decline. Good news is we have wonderful evidence-informed uh, guidelines on how to safely and effectively get women back to running um, after having a baby. And uh, nearly, what well, I have to say, almost all really good Australian pelvic floor physios are aware of these guidelines and know how to implement them and individualise them to every woman they see. So the other inciting factor that can lead to a rapid decline in pelvic floor function is the wonderful menopause. Female sex hormones, and in particular progesterone and estrogen, are super important for your pelvic floor health. However, they peak in your 30s and they start to decline, with the average age of menopause being around the 50 to 53. Estrogen is essential for your pelvic floor. It's in every collagen cell of your body. It's essential for muscle and tissue development, for pelvic floor muscle function, for urethral sphincter function, for pelvic ligament function, for vaginal lubrication. So it is fairly important and without it, we can start to feel the effects. As your estrogen levels drop, you may start to suffer perimenopausal symptoms. So perimenopause is that phase around menopause. Menopause is when your period has stopped for 12 months. But as you saw in that previous slide, you may start to feel symptoms from 35. From over there. Amongst other things, your muscles, all of your muscles, just won't be as strong or as powerful as they used to be. And you'll have to work way harder to gain and maintain muscle. And unfortunately, you're just a little bit more susceptible to other injuries, such as tendon injuries, but we can talk about that another time. In your pelvic floor, you are more susceptible to pelvic floor dysfunction because your pelvic floor muscles may have lost some of their bulk and they just can't close that weak spot as powerfully um, or they can't dissipate, control, or absorb those ground reaction forces as easily. So pelvic floor dysfunction in running, and it doesn't matter whether it's because you've had a baby or because you're perimenopausal or postmenopausal, or you've just increased your load a bit too much. The, the management um, guidelines remain the same. Talk with the GP. Talk with your women's health GP. You know, we've, we've already heard from one really good one today um, because there's a number of medical options, medical options available to you. 
but I really encourage you to see a pelvic floor physio as soon as possible. A pelvic floor physio will listen to all of your concerns and ask you a number of questions to get a really good understanding of where you're at and also where you want to get to. Um, the physio will need to do some form of assessment and there's lots of different ways, but the preferred way from a pelvic floor physio is through a vaginal examination, which is a non-painful examination that, where the physio will literally check your muscles of your pelvic floor to determine their condition and how well they, well they contract or relax, and relax rather. Once a physio has done an examination of the pelvic floor, as well as you as a woman, they will explain in simple terms what's going on and why, and then together you will determine a treatment plan to help you achieve your goals. The next key area in treating pelvic floor dysfunction in running is to modify your running loads. And that means decreasing the speed, intensity, duration or frequency of your running down to a level where you don't have any symptoms. And as you improve, you and your physio together will slowly increase that again. And as I just mentioned before, as well as specific pelvic floor assessment and treatment, the physio will assess your other running muscles and help to structure a program to ensure that you're strong, particularly through the glutes, core and lower body. And that will help your running efficiency, or sorry, your running efficiency and help to dissipate or absorb and control those ground reaction forces through the body for each step. So just in summary, Pelvic floor dysfunction is not normal, ever. Pelvic floor dysfunction should not be a taboo topic, so I'd encourage you to get talking with your girlfriends. And finally, don't consider any pelvic floor dysfunction in running as normal or part of the course. Get some help. And we're here. Thanks. And that's about it, Claire. Awesome. Thanks, Beck. Um, again, we've been uh, inundated with questions, so... Um, mm -hmm. I'll go straight to the top of the list. Uh, the first one is, what are the best exercises to improve pelvic floor health and strength? I've been given Kegel exercises in the past as sciatica recovery or strengthening generally. Are these effective? Um, yes, they are. The short answer is they are effective, but it's just like with your hamstring, quad, or whatever it is, other injury rehab, they have to be progressively loaded. So. Just doing your pelvic floor exercise in sitting, you know, um, often you're told to squeeze for 10 seconds and then let go for 10 seconds, do it 10 times and do some fast ones as well. Um, that's really great for the average person who just perhaps wants to walk around the block, but for a runner, it needs to be progressed and working with a pelvic floor physio will help to progress that up to the load, uh, sorry, up to the strength that's required for running. So there's more progressions is basically what I'm saying. Cool. Um, the next one is, should we be doing mindful pelvic floor exercises while running? Is there any benefit doing this in addition to exercises while also sedentary? Um, there was a really nice study, the one which looked at the, uh, I go back to, oh, don't mind me. Oh, no, well, who knows where it is now, that one there. So the follow-up study to this one, um, which looked at whether doing some reflexive training of the pelvic floor in addition to pelvic floor muscle training made the pelvic floor stronger with running um, or decreased in consonance with running, I think, sorry, just from memory, versus just doing pelvic floor muscle training. And just doing an individualised pelvic floor muscle training um, where we just make that harder and harder was better than trying to squeeze your pelvic floor when you run, okay? So, so no, I wouldn't advise that. I'd advise, again, working with a pelvic floor physio if you're having problems and devising an individualised program that just, yeah, that, that's for you. Cool. All right. I reckon um, we'll leave it there for the moment. Beck, thank you very much. Okay. I'll just see and, if I can stop uh, sharing. We'll um, shuffle on over to...